as you know, this panel is on the Inter-American System, which is the regional human rights system relevant to the United States, uh, which you'll hear much more about. And our two panelists are some of the most uh, experienced advocates and practitioners uh, in the Inter-American System. They both worked with some of the leading organizations and are now um, at their own human rights clinics. Uh, Roxana Altholtz here is uh, the Associate Director of the Berkeley International Human Rights Clinic. And previously she had been with the Center for Justice and International Law, also known as CEHIL, which for those of you who have done any work in the inter-American system already, you're probably familiar with that organization. Um, it's, it's their core area of work and, and they're really kind of leading the way in terms of uh, litigation and advocacy in the Americas before the inter-American system. Um, and Roxana has a variety of projects at the clinic that um, you can read more about on their website and maybe she'll have time to tell us more about, um, but they're a very active, <laughs> very active group. And then um, to her left is Jim Cavallaro, who is the director of Stanford's International Human Rights and Conflict Resolution Clinic. Uh, he joined Stanford after being with Harvard's uh, Human oh Rights <coughs> <laughs> Clinic. <laughs> no rivalry there. Um, <laughs> I have a degree from Berkeley, so. Yes. Where, does, where, where would you want, no. <laughs> I have split affinities, but carry on. <laughs> They're both in California now. Yes. That's all that matters. Um, and <laughs> Jim, in addition to running uh, the Stanford Clinic now, which he is the founding director of, um, was also just last week elected to serve as a commissioner on the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, which um, <laughs> is not only an amazing accomplishment um, in his career, but has been really welcomed by civil society um, and human rights supporters <laughs> throughout the Americas. Um, mm -hmm. The staff at the commission, um, civil society groups that have engaged with the commission have all expressed their delight uh, at Jim's election and look forward to this new composition of the commission as being one of the most um, experienced and pro-human rights uh, commissions in recent memory. So thank you, Jim, for being here. Um, I know you've been <laughs> quite busy um, with those elections and everything else. Um, but as you can see, we have two people here who um, are very experienced in the American system and will be able to tell us um, all of the nitty gritty. <laughs> so thank you. So thank you, Lisa, and thank you for the organizers. This is, it's always fun to be on a panel with Jim, and we're going to try to keep this informal and interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions as they arise. I'm going to start trying to give kind of an overview of how the Inter-American system works, and Jim's going to interrupt me and correct me if he wants to, or he's going to say save his comments to the end and, and talk about how U.S. advocates have, have used the Inter-American system. So as, as Lisa mentioned, I worked for five years for the Center for Justice International Law, um, and it's the only organization in the region exclusively dedicated to litigation before the Inter-American system, advocacy before the Inter-American system. We had, when I was there, around 300 cases, and I was in charge of about 40 cases. Um, so, you know, it's, it's an active litigation practice. And I was there from the year 2000 to the year 2005. So in the midst of my time there, of course, September 11th happened. And um, when September 11th happened, and then we saw the reuse of, of Guantanamo, um, the base at Guantanamo Bay as a place to house what looked to us and, you know, who are working in, in, in Latin America as, as a clandestine detention center for the disappeared, we were very interested in how we could use the inter-American system to push against that policy and practice that we had thought, you know. Excuse me. Uh huh. Speak into the mic. Sure, sure. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Um, that we thought had been um, pretty resoundingly um, eliminated from from the Americas. Um, so we presented with a group of of other organizations a petition. Um, before the Inter-American Commission 
a petition for um, a case and a petition for precautionary measures, and I'm going to explain in a second what that means, what that distinction is about. Um, and what we want, what we asked for at that point was for detainees to be identified, for them to have access to their lawyers, to lawyers, and to consular advice. And at that moment, this article appeal appeared in the Washington Post. It was February 2002 that covered our, reported on our efforts, this group of, of lawyers, clinics, organizations. And for some reason, the way that article described the Inter-American Commission always stuck with me. Um, the article said that, um, it began um, describing the commission as, I quote, an obscure seven-member panel of the Organization of American States that would take up this petition. The article went on to say that the petitioner's goals was as much to put public pressure on the Bush administration as it, it was to wage a legal attack. And then it said, because even if the panel grants all their requests, the U.S. government is certain to reject the ruling because it historically had insisted it is not legally bound by the commission's actions. And these were the words of one of the lawyers who was interviewed for the article that was representing the interests of the detainees. Now, you all are advocates. You know that we use our resources very strategically. We have to. We have to think very carefully about where we're going to invest our energy and our resources. And a quite formidable and impressive group of lawyers had decided to put their weight behind this petition and, and request um, a hearing before the inter-American system. And one of the attorneys is quoted as saying, the U.S. has been singularly disdainful of the commission's finding, findings, but this could, be a val this could be valuable in establishing the U.S. is violating human rights law and make it harder for the U.S. to ignore international criticism of its detainee parties policies, excuse me. As a lawyer at Sahil, the article stayed with me, I thought, because, I think because to describe the commission as obscure was so different from the way the commission was regarded in the other countries I worked. The commission and the court had handed down these incredibly important rulings, um, overturning amnesty laws, Throughout the region, we saw in Peru the particular impact of those laws um, and how after the Fujimori regime fell, um, in the, law, the court's decisions had led to renew hopes for an end to impunity and justice. We saw the commission and the court take a lead in defending indigenous rights and really specifically the right of indigenous peoples to prior informed and voluntary consent before governments took their land and, and exploited their resources. In Colombia, which was the country I was in most involved with, I saw multi-million dollar judgments by the Inter-American Court. And I was getting calls from the president's office saying, we've got to do something about these cases. Because Colombia had a policy at the time that whoever was responsible for the violation had to pay for the reparations. And so that money was coming out of the budget of the police and military, because most of our cases were paramilitary cases. And so, but in the United States, we have the commission described as this obscure body. And I wanted to tell this story because as you think about the inter-American system and you think about how to use it in advocacy, I think it's really important to think about it in context, political context, social context, but also to think about your initiative and how you can use it strategically. Um, <clears throat> Since we, we promised that we would have a yeah, more interactive ahead. discussion. And there I would just add, uh, you know, I've worked in the inter-American system as a Roxana, and in countries where there's a relatively high degree, relatively high degree of compliance, even there, there's some tension and there's a, a, the possibility that a state may exercise its sovereign prerogative not to comply with a particular sentence. As an advocate, it was always patently clear to me that one is better off with a discourse of whatever it is, Brazil has been held liable in this matter by the Inter-American Commissioner Court, and we have every expectation that Brazil will comply with its international obligations, as opposed to, gee, they really don't have to, and I don't know if they will. 
even if that's what one thinks, it, as an advocate, it, you don't want to make the other side's argument for them. So just wanted to say that that is true even if you're working outside of the United States and if you're working in any sort of context in which there's some ambiguity about what the actions of uh, the party ordered or requested or suggested to make a change is, you're probably better off leaning towards we expect this will happen. So. Yeah, and in fact, the, uh, you know, the Inter-American Commission was the first international body, to go back to the Gitmo example, to make a public statement about what ha was happening at Guantanamo Bay. The Red Cross had presence there, but the Inter-American Commission was the first. And I remember really, very clearly being in a hearing where um, Pepe Salaquet was the president of the commission at the time. He's a Chilean um, who was involved in um, you know, uh, post the war in the armed conflict in Chile, really investigating what happened. He's a torture survivor. And it was incredibly powerful to have this man, I think he was well into his 60s, experience torture himself to direct questions at the American delegation who were represented by Department of Homeland Security, Department of Justice, others, about the use of torture, the use of arbitrary detention, the use of clandestine detention centers, incredibly powerful. And they sent a letter that they made public, which was very unusual in the commission, about Gitmo and about how the United States could not create a territory that not, did not fall, that fell outside both of international humanitarian law and international human rights law. Um, and that case, the Gitmo case, is continuing to be litigated today. And the way I see, and I'm not as familiar with this case now because I'm no longer involved, but the way I see it, um, petitioners use the case strategically to bring up issues um, that are most pressing at Guantanamo Bay. So most recently they had a hearing and they talked about the hunger strikes. And that made a lot, generated a lot of news, a lot of coverage. But more importantly, a more nuanced understanding of what was happening at Guantanamo Bay. Can, I'm uh -huh, sorry, can yes. I jump in there? And we can do this on and on unless this thing drives no, me crazy. No, go ahead. But, <clears throat> but I would not, as an advocate, underestimate the potential advocacy value of forcing high level authorities to sit before an international body and have to justify what they're doing. Because at a minimum, you will force those authorities to go back within their departments, bureaus, agencies, bureaucracies, check in with people, get information, find out what's going on, send a message downward across within institutions, get the information back, go back, have to sit on the hot seat, experience discomfort, rethink what they're doing as a matter of policy, and then go back to their uh, organizations. And those folks are likely to be advocates, even if they're doing it silently, or there's a good chance that they'll be advocates within departments, bureaus, agencies, and organizations for positions that more closely uh, follow international law. So uh, we'll go into some detail, and, and I'll let Roxana talk, I promise, about how this works and what the system is, et cetera. And one of the things you may find is that hierarchical compliance, as we may like it to exist as attorneys, in that we would like to be able to go to a court, have a court issue a final ruling, and then have all subordinate governmental agencies capitulate accept that determination and implement accordingly, that that might not be the way change occurs. It doesn't mean that using international mechanisms is unimportant, and it doesn't mean that international mechanisms are not a means to advance an advocacy agenda. Yeah, and I think that in the Latin American tradition, I think maybe that understanding of how these mechanisms work is is more accessible on an intuitive level. I mean, in, in Latin America, a lot of the, of the work, the human rights work for many decades was to build what in Spanish is called a memoria historica, it's a documentation effort. It's an effort to influence um, in an incremental way power. Um, and you know, we in the United States are less developed in terms of our human rights movement as other countries um, in Latin America. And I think we have a lot to learn from the strategies they've used to address these systemic, systematic issues. Um, so let's start with kind of laying out how the inter-American system works. And I'm gonna encourage Jim to continue to interrupt me because it'll just be more interesting. Aren't you glad he's a commissioner now? That's exciting. 
Okay, so let me talk first about what the Organization of American States is because the Inter-American Commission and the Inter-American Court are the human rights branch of the Organization of American States. So the Organization of American States is the oldest regional organization. You can kind of think of it as the UN, but of the Americas. And it was, um, it is a political forum for multilateral dialogue and actions. Its major concerns have been the promotion of democracy, human rights, security, trade, and development. If you haven't heard of the Organization of American States, um, it's not just because you're American, it's because it's not very effective. And if you've heard of the Organization of American States, you've probably heard about it because um, of the Inter-American Commission and the Inter-American Court, which is interesting. Or you, maybe you've heard of the Pan-American Health Organization. That's also a quite active organization. But you know, the organ if you look at the organogram of the Organization of American States, it's a bunch of committees and secretariats that you've probably never will never come into contact with. But what's interesting is the commission and the court, which is one of the, the more active parts of the OAS, have an extremely small part of the OAS budget. In fact, the Inter-American um, Commission have a, has a budget of about, now that remember, this is the body in charge of monitoring and defending human rights in all of the Americas. It is a budget of $4.3 million. And that was, um, I remember when I was at Sahil, it was, it was a blow to our pride that the commission's publications, many of them on the back, had the seal of the European Union. Because they didn't have enough money from the money they were given by state to nations and the OAS to pay for their publications, so they had to go to the European Union, which isn't a source of funds right now, to try to pay for, for their publications. The court has the maximum tribunal on human rights in the Americas, has a budget of 2.1 million. So that puts kind of in perspective, I mean, it's quite impressive what these organizations have been able to accomplish given how resource poor they are. So the Organization of American States has 35 members. Um, the, every country in the Americas, every state is a member of the Organization of American States, except for Cuba, it was kicked out. Um, its foundational document is the Organization of American State Charter. So, the commission, the court, um, this regional human rights body is based on the European system. And may have, some of you have, may have heard of the European court that has 44 full-time judges and a budget, I think, of $40 million. Um, but the inter-American system grew up in a very different political and economic context than the European. The inter-American system grew up at a time of dictatorships where um, state of emergency was a, a pervasive um, technique used by governments to limit civil and human rights, civil liberties and human rights, where the judiciary was very weak. So while the European regional human rights system has been able to rely on national constraints, the inter-American system has had to contend with really fight against secretive and an unchecked executives and an auto-restrained judiciary. There's nothing so timid often as a judiciary in Latin America, and that's changing, but um, was very true for very long. Um, so as I mentioned, there's 35 members of the Organization of American States. 24 have ratified the American Convention, which is the primary treaty in the inter-American system, and 29, 22 have recognized the jurisdiction of the inter-American court. So, you know, states write the treaties, States also decide whether they want to come under the jurisdiction of these international bodies. The United States has neither ratified the treaty and has not submitted itself to the jurisdiction of the Inter-American Court, so the court does not have jurisdiction to decide cases against the United States. It signed the, it signed the American Carter Convention. Signed it. Signed it first. Mm -hmm. So if the United States has ratified How 
how does the United States manage to keep Cuba out of, of the OAS? The OAS was um, actually, and I don't remember, I don't no, know at what States point. The United States is in the OAS. Uh, just, right. just to be very clear on the nomenclature here. The United States is clearly a member of the OAS. So is Canada and the other dozen countries that have, uh, or 10 countries that have not ratified the American Convention. Separate from the OAS charter, which the United States has rat ratified, and right. the United States is party, there are human rights bodies. And, and uh, Roxana will explain that even though the United States has not ratified the American Convention, it is still subject to the jurisdiction of the Inter-American Commission by virtue of its having ratified the OAS Charter in conjunction with the Buenos Aires Protocol in 1967 and the interpretations of the law of the Americas by uh, the Inter-American Commission. Separate question is about Cuba's engagement with the OAS, which is probably a question for an another day. Um, at least for me it is. Uh. Thank you, Jim. Um, so <laughs> the Inter-American Commission is established by the OAS Charter. It was established in 1959. Um, and its mandate includes not just the promotion of human rights, but the defense of human rights. And if you read and you compare, which I'm sure you all will do in your spare time, the OAS Charter and the UN Charter, you'll find that the mandate laid out for human rights in the OAS, char OAS Charter is much stronger than the UN Charter because these the commission is mandated not just to promote but to protect, defend human rights. Um, the commission is also recognized in most of the, the in all the treaties that um, are, are part of the inter-American system. So just like the UN system that has treaties on civil and political rights, economic and social rights, et cetera, children, discrimination, the inter-American system has its own treaties. The primary treaty, as I mentioned, is the American Convention on Human Rights, but there's also treaties on economic, social, and cultural rights, death penalty, forced disappearances, torture, violence against women. So how many of you have heard of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights? And how many, you all probably think the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was the primary first human rights document. It is not. It is not. <laughs> the first one, and this is important to me because my family's coming, <laughs> was signed in Bogota, Colombia. It's the American Declaration. So it's declaration, not a treaty. A declaration is a common understanding of, of world consensus, or, or in this case, the America's consensus on um, what rights and duties um, should be um, protected. Um, and this is the document, as um, Jim mentioned, that the United States must abide by, by um, under its membership to the OAS. So the commission has jurisdiction through individual petitions to decide whether the United States has violated or not an article, a right protected in the American Declaration. And that's important for a lot of reasons. One is the Inter-American Commission is the only international human rights body in the world with jurisdiction to hear an individual complaint, not reports, not communications, an individual complaint against uh, the United States. No interruption. No, no, oh, I, I, that that I would just underscore, you know, three times in bold. Uh, <coughs> Say it in a deeper voice. The American Declaration <laughs> is the only basis for an individual complaint before the American Convention against the United States, and it is also the only oversight body to which the United States has subjected itself. Now, at some level, it may well have subjected itself to this international oversight quasi-intentionally or unintentionally in that it is not possible to be a member of the OAS without accepting the jurisdiction of the commission through the, through the American Declaration, right? Uh, whereas you can be part of the UN without <coughs> having recognized, and even you may even ratify uh, the, the, uh, the covenant on civil and political rights without recognizing the, op the optional protocol. But within the inter-American system, there's no way to escape the oversight of the inter-American uh, commission through the American Declaration and the OAS Charter. Some say that may be why the United States has accepted that jurisdiction. 
<clears throat> yeah, accepted. I don't know if I'd use that word. Accepted. Yeah. I would they, say they more. They push the back jurisdiction the has been imposed on the United States, and the United States. But okay, right. Mr. Commissioner, you probably okay. So, um, so this is the interim. The, the commissioners that are currently um, the people who are currently commissioners with the Inter American at the Inter American Commission. This lineup will change. Um, you take possession yeah. in January. Yeah. So three of these members will, well, no, two of the members, one was reelected, two will leave and be replaced by two new people. Um, the way that commissioners are elected is by the General Assembly of um, the Organization of American States. The commissioners are not to represent the state that nominates them as candidates. Jim, for example, is nominated as an independent candidate by the United States. They are not to represent the country that nominates them, the state that nominates them. They're there in their personal capacity, and they're all, like Jim, people of high moral character and professional competence. The United States... <laughs> you don't expect me to bite at that one, do you? <laughs> yeah, I always thought it was interesting that the United States and other states also find this interesting, that the United States, even though it hasn't ratified the American Convention and hasn't accepted the jurisdiction of the Inter-American Court, has always had one of its candidates on the Inter-American Commission, except for the years yeah, after 9-11. Yeah, they, they tried to get sale. Mel Martinez, um, a good friend of the Bush family, the Martinez family from Florida, they tried to get him elected, and the states, there was this um, just rejection in the Americas against US policies in their global war against terrorism, and he wasn't elected. So there were a few years, but most of the history of the commission, they've always had a US candidate. Okay. So what are the major activities of the Inter-American Commission? So the commission has jurisdiction, as we've mentioned, to hear individual cases, um, to decide precautionary measures, and I'm gonna explain the difference between those two things in a second. They also um, hold hearings. The commission meets twice a year. Oh, I should go back to this, because Jim may not know this. Commissioners are not paid a salary. <laughs> They're there on a part-time basis. Um, and it's extraordinary that the primary human rights bodies of the Americas does not have full-time commissioners. And cover your ears, Jim. The people who do all the work at the commission are not the commissioners. They're the lawyers. And I think now the commission probably has about 30 to 35 lawyers. Um, is that right? Yep. Yeah, around there? About 30, 31, I think. So, um, <laughs> you know, as, a, <coughs> as an advocate, one of my jobs was to be, to know the lawyers at the commission very well. <laughs> because my cases depend on their ability to, to see what I saw in the cases and to push them forward. <clears throat> okay, so the commission meets, um, has hearings twice a year, but I think the commission meets four times a year. Yeah, just one more time in, in the U.S. and another time elsewhere. Right. So headquartered in D.C., the commission meets three to four times a year, but has hearings twice a year, and I'll explain more about what that means. The commission, through its history, has also conducted on-site visits and issues report issued reports. In fact, for the first couple decades that the commission operated, it really focused on investigation and reporting, and not so much on the individual complaint procedures. And I think it's important to understand that the commission is a quasi-judicial body. And so those tools that the commission uses outside the individual complaint mechanism to address human rights violations are incredibly important. And one of my favorite leyendas, myths about the inter-American system comes from Argentina. And I don't know if this is true, but that's what makes it good. I grew up in Texas, my parents are, you know, my mother's Colombian, it doesn't matter if it's true, it's just a good story, right? So um, in the early 80s, um, as many of you probably know, that knew, know there was a military junta um, that governed Ar Argentina. 
and they were practicing in a systematic and systemic way forced disappearances. The commission was one of the only and the first international bodies to investigate that. And they went to Argentina and they documented, they went to even clandestine detention centers and interviewed detainees and documented this um, use of this forbidden, forbidden crime and then published a report. And the myth is, or, or what's said is, that after that report was published, not a single other person was disappeared in Argentina. And so the, in Argentina, the commission is not an obscure body. If there is a car crash in Argentina, people will get out of the car and go, te voy a demandar ante el sistema interamericano, che, boludo. <laughs> That was my really bad Argentine accent, but something like that. And during Argentine's financial crisis, um, at Coralito in 2002, 3,000, almost 3,000 complaints were submitted before the Inter-American Commission. The statistics for that year have all the petitions and, and numbers and categorized and analyzed, and all the Coralito uh, petitions separately. Yeah. It basically broke the system. Uh, it broke. The so in Argentina, the commission is is, is a big deal, is a big deal. And, and that's important to know. I mean, people aren't going to submit a complaint if they don't think that the system can give them justice. So that's a sign of saying, give me justice. I believe in this. Um, all right, so let's start with each of these activities. Let's start first with the individual cases. So one of the things that, and one of the tensions in, in the system is balancing the desire to professionalize the system with the imperative of ensuring that the system remains accessible, not just to attorneys, but to everyone in the Americas. So right now, the inter-American system has very broad and generous standing requirements. In order to submit um, a petition before the inter-American commission, you don't. Um, you can be any group, any person. If you're an NGO, you have to be le legally recognized in one of the OAS states. You don't even have to have the consent of the victim to submit a petition on their behalf, which for lawyers is like, oh, what? Well, uh, think about um, in, in, in it is sometimes too dangerous or impossible to get the consent of the victims. Think about forced disappearances, for example. But, but hold on a second. Just there, it's worth highlighting, and I know uh, that this is certainly Roxana's practice and Sahil's and others. Certainly, you want to make every effort to be in touch with the stakeholders, the organization, et cetera, bef before you decide on your own to file a petition based on a situation that strikes you as unjust. Uh, and that's not a matter of what Article you know, uh, 44 or, or, uh, requires. It's a matter of uh, best practice and, and, and not practice. placing people in danger and being ethical. So let me just flag that. One thing what the rules allow, another thing is what good sense and, and good practice and ethics uh, demand of us. I, I agree with that, and I think one of the weaknesses, and I don't know if you would agree with this, but one of the weaknesses of the U.S. advocacy effort before the inter-American system has been it's too lawyer-driven, it's too clinic-driven in reality. Um, it's If you look at the roster of people involved in presenting cases, it's like, you know, every international human rights clinic in the country, and, and I litigate before the inter-American system, so I say that with a bit of humility, but... Um, it's it's way too lawyer driven. So, I, I I I while that's true that you you know ethical moral practice you should have access you should have contact. I think that we shouldn't think of of the system as only part of the domain of attorneys. Um, in fact, some of the best litigants for me in the inter American system have have been anthropologists. Oddly, very good at describing well, and explaining. <laughs> So um, the petition, so the petition must allege a violation of one of the treaties. So during the Iraq and Afghanistan war, there were lots of petitions that came through to the commission that alleged violations that the commission simply didn't have jurisdiction over. Um, in the, as we've mentioned several times, um, for the United States, the petition has to allege a violation of the American Declaration. So it has to be alleged a violation putable to a state. So there's two main procedural phases um, uh, during the litigation of an individual complaint before the inter-American system. The admissibility phase, and this is where the commission decides whether it has jurisdiction to consider a complaint. 
and the merits phase, and this is where the commission decides whether the facts alleged constitute a violation of, of a treaty of international law. So one of the major components of the admissibility phase is deciding whether um, petitioners have exhausted domestic remedies, and this is a doctrine that's technical, and we don't need to go into too much detail here, but I do want, I think it's important for everybody to understand that all international bodies are, are um, established in a way to make them complementary, complementary and subsidiary to national mechanisms. And what that means at the end of the day is international bodies work when national legal systems fail. So the rule is you have to exhaust domestic remedies before you get to the Inter-American Commission or really any international body. But like any rule, good rule, there are exceptions. And in the Inter-American system, the ex exceptions include um, if the domestic law doesn't create, establish a remedy for the violation, if the petitioner's access to the remedy has been denied, or if there's unwarranted delay. So let me give you an example. I would say 80% of the commissions, the bread and butter of the commission's work, unfortunately, are violations um, like massacres, extrajudicial killings, torture, forced disappearances, where the remedy that should be exhausted would be, well, in the case of forced disappearance, habeas corpus writ, in the case of the other t life and limb violations, criminal investigations. And it's precisely where the judiciaries in Latin America fail, the investigation and prosecution of those kinds of crimes. So the inter-American system isn't putting petitioners in a position to have to wait until the commission, to, until, until the criminal investigation is completed in order to present a commission. Because if the criminal investigation goes on for too long, and too long depends on the violation. I think the court has said six years for a massacre, two years for a torture, and there's no culmination of the criminal investigation, you can submit a petition. One thing just to note there, <clears throat> if you have a final determination of the system, if that exists, which you think is unjust in the US, and you think the US determination, wherever it is, is final, is a violation, uh, you have six months, you have six months to file a petition to the Inter-American Commission. So it's not that much time, and you can be timed out. Again, if you're working on a legal theory that involves an exception, so you have someone who's been forcibly disappeared or someone who's uh, in, in some way has his or her rights violated, and the investigation is going on, and the uh, a purported uh, prosecution is taking three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine years, you don't have a final determination, and you're entering into one of these, you using one of these three exceptions to gain access to the commission. That's a different circumstance. If there is a final determination, you've got six months, so, you know, oh, heads up, don't, don't get timed out. I've seen cases, very good cases get timed out. And, and in fact, mo most U.S. cases, when they lose, they lose in the admissibility stage, and they use be lose because of exhaustion. Um, so they're dismissed, and there's no appeal to a dismissal in the inter-American system. Um, so these are, these are just graphic representations of the admissibility and the, um, and the merits procedure. I mean, I'm gonna toggle back and forth. You know, these are real simplified versions. You look at this and you think, wow, I can present a petition, and two years later I'm gonna have a decision. No, this takes four to seven years depending on the case. Um, and there's lots of back and forth, and I think as lawyers, at least, um, you know, usually in domestic law, what you're thinking about is the judgment. How do I get to the end? How do I get to the end? How do I get to the end? And the inter-American system is very different as a litigant. Um, you're not necessarily trying to, y your primary or your ultimate objective may be the judgment, but it's not going to be your only one. And, and Jin may mentioned some of the reasons why. When a case is submitted before the Inter-American Commission, what happens? Your complaint gets transferred to the state. And it gets usually transferred to, in most states, the equivalent of the Department of State, so the foreign ministry. And so your case, which may have been a local case, 
It may have been a case about, I don't know, judicial misconduct or you know, lack of competence by a particular judge or something that's happening in, contamin in, in a contaminated area in a particular place or something local, a prison condition of a particular prison becomes a national issue. And that's enormously important. Because what happens is the case goes to the State Department or the Foreign Ministry of X country, and national authorities have two months to respond. And to respond, what do they have to do? They have to, I don't know, get into a room and talk to the different state agencies, but also talk locally and say, what the hell is going on here? What's happened? Why are we asking to respond um, to this at, at the international level? The other thing that happens incredibly is, and for my clients, it's really, the inter-American system is usually the first time they're ever on equal footing with the state. So, you know, and, and that happens on paper in the pleadings. You submit a brief, the state has to respond. Where usually the experience of my clients is you submit a complaint, you submit a brief, and nothing happens. In the inter-American system, most states, with the exception of some of the English-speaking Caribbean states, most states respond, including the United States. The United States briefs their response to the inter-American system are quite thoughtful. Um, and they are the product, I think, of um, confer conferral between different agencies. Um, so suddenly, petitioners are on equal footing with the state, and um, they're before an independent and impartial panel of experts that are experts in human rights. And that's a game changer, right? And then you have the, the way the narrative is um, impacted. Uh, Jim and I have this ongoing discussion, argument, blood, war, I don't know, about this case I litigated and the significance that Jim says it's an utter failure. And I said, no, because what we did with this case. <laughs> As she tells it, but yeah. carry on. So yeah, this is like the Colombian Texas tall tale version, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, because I think with this case, what we did is you know, in a lot of countries, including the United States, what happened is the government exerts a monopoly over the narrative, a monopoly over the truth. So sometimes with these cases, what you do is you get to change the narrative. You get to give your version, your being your client's version. And that's enormously powerful. Um, so Affecting the dominant narrative is also one of the, what happens during the dynamic established by the, by the inter-American system. Algo más? Dale. Okay. Dale. Um, so this is the total number of complaints uh, received by year, and you, what you'll see is it's climbing quite steadily. So in 1997, around 435 complaints were submitted before the Inter-American Commission. And then in 2010, which is the year that I could find um, statistics for 15, almost 1,600 cases. And this graph doesn't include El Coralito, which is the economic crisis in Argentina, which was like something in 3,000 cases in 2002. And it doesn't include, in 2009, the cases submitted with respect to the coup in Honduras. Just cases, just petitions, just petitions, yeah. Just petitions. And you know, this is petitions by country for 2010. Now, uh, you may not be surprised by which countries have the most petitions submitted against it. Colombia, Mexico, Peru, Argentina, Chile. That may not surprise you. There's historic violations there and there's ongoing conflict there. But what may surprise you is that the United States is number seven. With um, 78 cases, or petitions, sorry. Um, I should be more precise in my language. Also, but they're not necessarily. Not only by per capita. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's it's also about historic violations and ongoing armed conflicts. So Colombia is. Yeah. 
Where is Brazil? It's a large South American country. Yeah. <laughs> you give them an inch. Right, there's Brazil here. There's Chile. So Chile is one, roughly a tenth of the size of Brazil, and it has more position. So in the United States, most of the cases have dealt with really death penalty. And I would say that most of the cases submitted against the United States have dealt with death penalty. And it's interesting, most of the cases have dealt with death penalty issues that later were taken up by the Supreme Court. Consular relations, the execution of juveniles, the execution of people with mental disabilities. <coughs> and that was strategic. That was not happenstance, that wasn't coincidence, that was part of the strategy of advocates. They wanted to get international statements about how far the United States had strayed from international standards and where the rest of the world was, and use those statements to build a domestic legal strategy. Now that's a decade strategy, that's you know long-term strategy, but very well done, very well executed, very well planned, and very well executed. But, but again, just uh, back to the earlier point, and I'm glad you, you, you raised this, uh, that's part of the way I think one has to see the inter-American system and its utility as an advocate, which is somewhat different from the way advocates tend to look at judicial or quasi-judicial bodies, where, you know, and Roxana made the point earlier, one thinks of, I want to get to the sentence. I want to win. How do I jockey? How do I... Uh, play procedurally so that I eventually get a victory, right? And this, there, uh, at one level, a lot of what you do in the inter-American system is think about during the process, how can I advance my agenda in parallel through the use of the media, through promoting discussion about uh, my case, my issue, et cetera, and then two, how can my case be, which is a different sort of approach, how can my case be part of a broader strategy to effectuate change? So I'm not gonna get a decision at the end, that will change the outcome necessarily in a particular uh, circumstance or set of, uh, of cases. But I might uh, help to create with other cases a uh, consensus about a legal position that then will be part of the calculus used by either domestic judicial authorities or governmental authorities in the executive branch or in state governments, et cetera, right? And that's maybe a little bit uncomfortable for those of us who are trained as attorneys to think of the court as the body that will provide uh, clear uh, justice and a definitive resolution. But it's something that you, I think I would strongly encourage you to wrap your head around if you're thinking of using supranational mechanisms, particularly against the United States. And I think it's, uh, it's making also kind of the bridge between individual representation and cause lawyering a little bit. So it's thinking about more holistically the advocacy strategy and, you know, the commission provides a stage for part of the theater <laughs> that's in, that is um, important in, in, in implementing those advocacy strategies, just to be very blunt. Um, so the, I think the second most frequent issue brought up in cases is immigration-related cases. Um, and the commission has had the opportunity to look at different aspects of our draconian immigration system, including administrative detention, detention conditions, prolonged detention. Um, so the commission, since 1961, one of its first on-site visit started looking at um, Los Marialitos, the Cuban refugees, and has continued to um, to, to look at that, uh, uh, that issue. They've also looked at cases involving lack of opportunity to seek humanitarian relief against um, deportation orders. And then there are kind of a hodgepodge of issues, um, including Gitmo, domestic violence, statehood, so the commission issued a a ruling on um, DC's right to um, statehood, um, environmental ca contamination. There's a really interesting case coming out of, um, I think Louisiana, it may be Mississippi, but I think it's Louisiana on environment, like uh, um, environmental justice issues. And then um, um, I think the most recent issue that has been brought in the form of an individual petition has been um, LWAP for juveniles. Um, and I think that's also part of a broader strategy. So you see LWAP for junior, juveniles coming up in different international forums and also being 
um, domest lit litigated domestically um, more aggressively. So the other procedural track before the inter-American system is precautionary measures. Um, so I like to make this analogy, which I don't know if is successful, but hopefully it will be, but I, I like it anyway. <laughs> So if you think about these procedural tracks, like in a domestic violence case, you have the criminal case, which is the case, which is the procedural track where you determine individual criminal liability for the act of violence, right? And that's what the individual petition is like. It's the commission determining. Of course, the commission doesn't have jurisdiction to determine individual, only state liability. But the commission is determining state international responsibility for an act often acts of violence. Um, and then you have the temporary restraining order. And that's what precautionary measures are like. The purpose of precautionary measures is, is to preserve the situation while the commission makes a determination and to ensure to prevent irreparable harm. So this is a separate track. Um, and um, the rules of this procedural tract are, are somewhat different. Petitioners to use this expedited procedure have to prove urgency, gravity, and the possibility of irreparable harm. They're not required to exhaust domestic remedies, and if they are successful, the commission, and I think it's the commission tries to make the decision within 48 hours, will issue a uh, order to the state to adopt measures to protect the right. So what's the typical precautionary measures case? The typical one is um, you have a case before the Inter-American Commission. It's a case involving a massacre. One of the witnesses um, that's implicating the military in the massacre is being threatened. So you request precautionary measures on behalf of the witness. You prove urgency. They receive, they've been receiving death threats. The last death threat is um, is, is, you know, they sent a bloody doll. That's gravity is a, a threat against life. That would also be the reparable harm. If the threat is carried out, the person will be killed. And what will the commission do? The commission will order the state to um, provide, to provide, to adopt measures to protect the person's life. That usually it's a negotiation, but usually it comes in the form of bodyguards, an armed vehicle. In the case of a witness, it may be inclusion in the witness protection program. And they are also order usually the state to investigate where the threats are coming from. So we use precautionary measures in a case um, post-Katrina. The commission, uh, the clinic did a number of initiatives around Katrina and in, in investigating what had happened, one of the things we discovered is that none of the early warnings that were issued before Katrina, in fact, the early warning system at a federal and state level only gave warnings in English. Although there was a significant non-English speaking um, population in the Gulf states, so the hurricane season was coming up, and we requested precautionary measures um, to ensure that the early wa warning system, or warnings were issued not only in English, but in other relevant language. And we alleged that people's life and limb were in jeopardy. We were not successful. <laughs> but that's the, 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 uh, an example of a <coughs> precautionary measure really pushing the envelope of where precautionary measures can go. Uh-huh. Yeah, and that's often what will happen. Often what the commission will do before they issue the order, if there's time, um, is they'll ask the state to tell them what's happening. And then they'll do follow-up. So once the order is issued, they will follow up with both the petitioners and the state um, to ensure that it's implemented, to monitor how it's implemented. So this is, oh, yeah, go ahead, sorry. No, you don't, although I think, th I think the commission is moving in the um, direction of changing that. So you didn't have to have a case um, in order to um, submit a request for precautionary measures. 
I, I, I don't think that's the best advocacy strategy. I think you should have a case because the commission isn't making a final determination on the merits of the case through precautionary measures. So you'll have this kind of endless follow-up to precautionary measures. So as a general rule, I think it's a good idea to have a case, but of course there are circumstances where independent a request for independent precautionary measures is warranted. And, and, and that, I think one of those circumstances, for example, was um, in El Salvador, there were precautionary measures requesting access to medication for um, people with HIV. And there wasn't time to submit a case and then request precautionary measures because people were dying. Um, and, the, and in that case, the commission actually granted the precautionary measures and they, and they turned out to be quite powerful. Uh huh. In this morning presentation um, about the ICCPR, we heard a lot about federalism issues and how um, either the state or the federal government might deflect responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, but particularly when you're dealing with state governments and with precautionary measures and also just generally complaints, I was curious how it works in this case too in the sense that you're dealing with an international body telling a state what to do and whether the state is receptive to that, whether the federal government um, is able you know, to influence the state government, sort of how the federalism issues work. I think you should answer that question because of your experience in Brazil. Uh, it's a hard question. It's, it's a really difficult question <laughs> and uh, the easy, uh, and I don't mean, mean this in a flippant way, uh, you know, but the easy short answer is it depends. Uh, and it depends on the state, it depends on the authorities in the state, it depends how important the issue is to federal authorities, it depends what sorts of, what sort of communications they have, it depends if they're uh, uh, same party in power in the federal government and the state, et cetera, et cetera. And so there's many, many variables. You know, in the United States. I'm saying all those factors are at play in, in, in the United States. Uh, I don't think that a state government is going to think that it is absolutely required to respond to a uh, precautionary measure request from the Inter-American Commission. That said, I do think it matters to a state government if they receive some communication and a couple of phone calls from the Department of Justice after those have been forwarded from the Department of State to the Department of Justice, uh, seeking information about a particular matter. It, it's, you know, it's a wake-up call. Someone's gonna do something. Maybe not exactly what you want her or him to do, but I think on the whole, probably better than having that authority or those authorities not receive that federal wake-up call. Will they implement hierarchically, absolutely, to the letter, the, the precautionary measure issued by the commission? Probably not. No. They've got other means of responding. The Brazilian government used to say that, uh, which yeah. would ab absolutely drive me uh, batty uh, because I felt that I, would, I was in advocating uh, on issues involving rights in Brazil. I was advocating before the commission and in the midst of it, providing a sort of international law 101 primer to the representatives of the Brazilian state that you know, that's nice that you have a federal system. There's, that's recognized in the American Convention, which Brazil had ratified, uh, but you ultimately must provide answers at the international level. That's the nature of the Ministry of Foreign Relations. Uh, but sort of you feel a bit, you're conflicted about having that role. Uh, but that, by the way, it's not, and I've seen that with other states as well. It's not, by the way, not unusual for, for to, not in a, some degree with the State Department as well, but I would say not as often, but it's not unusual for, uh, authorities to make arguments about international law that you find are, are unfortunately, yeah, inaccurate in proceedings before an international, who would have thought? Uh, and you know, that's, that's part of advocacy is either coaxing or pushing authorities towards positions that are, because ultimately at one level, I would say the lawyer instinct is to want to show the representative of the other state the back of your hand, right? and demonstrate I know more about this and, but you have to, re, you really have to sort of, I think, rethink your instincts because your goal is not necessarily to make that person look foolish. Your goal is to have that person recognize that what she or he needs to do is go back to capital, get on the phone, call state authorities and get them 
to make changes so that the national government can be in compliance with its international obligations. So it's tough because you do you want to just unleash your your inner litigant on them. I I actually have a different view of the state. I think that the in the United States, I think human rights people using human rights advocacy tools have been too focused on federal and national authorities, and I think it's been to the detriment of the movement. I think that a lot about, of not you're talking about in parallel to the system, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hold on, Jim. <laughs> so. I think actually um, local and maybe even state officials, and, and Colin may have left, Colin, no, there's Colin. I mean, so we're doing this um, Human Right to Water project in California, and this is part of what we're trying to think about is, you know, how do you bring international law and make it relevant to local authorities? And so one thing you may want to think about if you're thinking about prison, uh, prison conditions and you're doing a precautionary measure is, if it's about the warden, you know, really do what what um, Jim is is advocating for. Write into your petition. Tell the commission that this is entirely in the hands of the warden, and make sure that you have a strategy that reaches the warden and doesn't stop at the national level. And I think, to some extent, local and state authorities may might, might be I don't know if vulnerable, but susceptible, open to the power. And then I, I think about Coe's memo, Harold Coe's memo, this memo that he sent to um, um, uh, a state authorities and, and federal agencies that said, hey guys, we all have the obligation to implement international law. It says, well, okay, so report about I think he, it doesn't, it may not say implement, but I don't think it just says report. But okay, so it just says report. That's a step forward. It's a step forward. So I, I think it's incumbent on in us to continue and move the ball along a little bit. So I think, Senor Rivera, tenía una pregunta. Yeah, hi, um, my name is Francisco Rivera. I used to work at the Inter-American Court um, of Human Rights. And uh, there's a fan for the question of federalism, there's a fantastic article in the most recent edition of the Human Rights Brief that addresses the issue of federalism, because it's one of the arguments why the US doesn't want to ratify the American Convention. But during the, the, um, the negotiation phase of the American Convention, the US was able to include an article of the American Convention, Article 28, mm -hmm. that addresses federalism issue. Um, and, and the way that the commission and the court have addressed federalism, because not only the US is a federal state, you have Mexico, you have Argentina, you have uh, Brazil, and in, in, in all of those uh, contexts, the, both the commission and the court have held those states, which are federal states, liable for acts that uh, are made by the, uh, the individual states, states meaning the local governments, right? So it wouldn't, the federalism issue wouldn't really preclude the responsibility of the federal government for state actions, and, and by state, again, I mean local actions. So you should look up Human Rights Brief latest. Uh, um. Yeah, that's very clear. So any public agent, any state agent can, um, can create international state responsibility through their conduct or omissions. Did you write the article? He wrote the article. I wasn't oh. showing you. <laughs> that's the article. I'm helping his PR campaign. <laughs> it's fantastic. <laughs> exactly. Let me just say, by Francisco J. Rivera uh, Farita, Mariti, at the, so there's the author's right there. But I, he I heard he was somebody. an amazing clinician and extraordinary father. Did you hear the same I thing? I heard the same thing. Wow, it's <laughs> amazing. <laughs> so um, this is uh, precautionary measures by country that were granted in 2010. And again, you won't, maybe won't find surprising the countries with the most measures, Colombia, Honduras, Mexico, Guatemala, and there we have the United States. And my guess is, although I didn't verify this, my guess is those three grants were related to stays of execution um, in death penalty cases. So what the commission does quite routinely, um, because advocates request them to, is to um, grant precautionary measures for death penalty detainees um, and um, ask the state to stay the execution until the commission has an opportunity to reach a final decision in the case, and the United States routinely ignores those requests, but they're made. And you had a question, I'm sorry. Excuse me? 
No. Can you have a question? That Colombia and Mexico do not have the death penalty. Those cases have to do with violence and, and conflict, yeah. There's, there's been a change in uh, particularly in the precautionary measures regulations and I was wondering what the change was because I frankly didn't see it you know uh, this the standards for granting precautionary measures changed a year or two ago well, yeah, there's, a, there's, there's a process that's ongoing uh, so, and there's a, it's a very politicized process that can, I can try and summarize and a minute, mm -hmm. yeah, but please. there was a uh, precautionary measure issued in a, a dam. Uh, oh, that dam! Dam. Water project, Belo Monte, uh, in Brazil, and the Brazilian government reacted uh, quite ex in a quite extreme fashion to the precautionary measure. It's a it's a, it's a multi multi million dollar uh, project. Uh, which the president is uh, personally invested in, not financially, but she was the minister of mines before she became the president. The Brazilian government uh, responded uh, with a uh, strongly worded uh, response uh, by withdrawing their ambassador to the OAS, by withdrawing their candidate to the Inter-American Commission and uh, cutting funds to the OAS. Uh, to the commission, so uh, and that set off a, a, a two-year process of reform of the inter-American system uh, in several bodies within the OAS. It more or less came to a close in, uh, in a session on March 22nd of this year. Although the March 22nd resolution allows for the issue to, to continue to be discussed within the permanent council, and as a result of those pressures, the commission has proposed modifications to the precautionary measures procedures which would allow uh, states a greater opportunity to respond, uh, would require that they be consulted except in extreme circumstances, et cetera, et cetera. So in some ways, what's happened, and this is sort of, I would say, the political narrative of states, is that the use of precautionary measures, according to states, has grown significantly and has uh, allowed petitioners to bypass the uh, rather long and delayed case system in order to have issues addressed through the precautionary measures mechanism in a way that states believe is unfair to them because they do not have the same procedural guarantees that they would have in an individual case process. And that so has caused uh, the wrath of some states in the response uh, to the measures. But substantively, the standards are still the same. They're primarily still the same. I think the commission is going to be more hesitant moving forward to issue precautionary measures on behalf of collectives, so groups of individuals who are not individually individuated, um, and perhaps more more hesitant to issue precautionary measures um, against Brazil. when against Brazil. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Maybe I don't know, but more hesitant when the allegations don't involve. Um, violations or the eminence of violations to life and limb, but involve other types of, of allegations. That, that also works against petitioners, too, in the sense that if you don't get precautionary measures, you've got a, you've got a 10, 10, 12 year wait. I think, it also, I think it also works against petitioners in another way. If you make a request for precautionary measures and you don't get it, what does it say about the strength of your allegations? And so, I, yeah, no, I, I, I agree. But I, th I, again, I also think that, and, and th I think this is what Jim and I have been trying to say, is the dynamic of the inter-American system is useful. And even if the case, it doesn't take 10 to 12 years before the commission, it may take three to seven. But during that space of time, the dynamic can be helpful to advocacy. And that cannot be replaced through a precautionary measures request. And I think that US advocates have tended, and, and Colombian advocates to a certain degree have tended to make only precautionary measures requests. And now their presence and strength of litigation before the inter-American system is less strong than it, than it could be. Okay. I, I think we're in questions now, right? This is, uh, do you, is this the last slide? Or you have I have a couple more slides. I can do it in three minutes. Let me do the two couple, minutes. the two. So let me, and then we'll get to your question, and 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 we. Just to clarify what my comment uh, before, just I think you were. Uh, 
just on the Harold Coe memos, I looked at them again. The language is more towards reporting, but it mentions implementation in a general broad sense by saying that b when the US ratified the treaties, we already, not if we already made it, we already said that we're already complying, but now we're just gonna report on implement implementation of these treaty obligations. So I'm sorry that I interjected in an inaccurate fashion. I think you, <laughs> what I tried to say that the emphasis, the I'm glad we are was both right, that's the best yeah. result. <laughs> The, em the emphasis is still on reporting, but yeah. I, I agree with you. It's a f it, it was a, f a good step forward, but good. still not good enough. But we're we're good. You just wanted to clarify that. Thank you, thank you. So um, hearings. So the commission holds a number of hearings um, every year, usually in a session in October and another session in October in in March. If you want to request hearings, usually you have to request them 40 days before the session. So you have to think about that date. It, it for me, it's a substantive it, request. Not just yeah. I would like a you know a hearing on X, like yeah. several pages with detail why it's important. Uh, good to have a good coalition of NGOs and civil society and grassroots movements involved in your request. Absolutely. So, what kind of hearings have involved in the U, um, United States most recently? And this is just some of the issues that have been brought up in hearings against the United States. You can request the presence of the state or not. I always like to request the presence of the state because then how is the hearing fun? So sometimes you can have a hearing in the context of a case, and so the state will certainly be present because it is their right to defense. But if you're just requesting a hearing on a general situation, you can decide whether or not to request the presence of the state. But it's always important to, I think, bring these issues to the attention of, of authorities. Um, the other... Um, tools the commission uses is country and thematic reports. The, in 2011, this may interest you, the commission issued a report on due process and detention in the, con in the immigration context in the United States. It's also issued a number of thematic reports that are maybe of interest to you on death penalty, victims of sexual violence, detainees, people of African descent, access to reproductive health. And the commission has um, conducted on-site visits throughout the years to the United States. It's never done a full country visit to the United States, but it's done discrete on-site visits. And I looked at the list, and it appears that every on-site visit has been about migrants and immigrants' rights. Um, most recently, I think they visited El Paso and the southern states. Um, so we're not going to talk in length about the Inter-American Court because the United States hasn't accepted the jurisdiction of the Inter-American Court, but I did want to mention it existed. I would say that the Inter-American Court really doesn't start to work probably until the 90s, even though it was established in 1979. And the court has an adversarial procedural track, so it also has jurisdiction to hear individual complaints. You have to exhaust the commission before you get to the court and only the commission or state can refer a case to the Inter-American Court, so petitioners don't have that, uh, that standing. The court, which is different from the commission, has the authority under the American Convention to issue binding judgments and to issue reparations. And the com one of the most extraordinary aspects of the court is their interpretation of what reparations. So we're not just talking about monetary reparations, I just won a case before the Inter-American Court, forced disappearances in Guatemala, and the court ordered the state to pay my clients more than $8 million in, in, in compensation. But more importantly to my clients, the court ordered the state to find the victim's remains, to construct a national park dedicated to the memory of the victims, um, to, uh, to, do a docu to produce a documentary about what had happened to publish the ruling. And so they have a very holistic, integrated approach to reparations. The court also has jurisdiction to issue precautionary measures, but they call them provisional measures. And then the court can issue advisory opinions and has done so on a range of issues um, related to the United States, although they're not country specific usually. And I think at least getting back to Gitmo, which is where we started, you look at the early advisory opinions. They're on issues about states of emergencies, habeas corpus, 
um, some of the issues that really are war on terror, which isn't so different from the war on terror, terror that the Guatemalan, the El Salvadorian, the Argentina regimes ra waged, um, have brought up again. So that's where my slide presentation is. So I, I think, I'm not sure how close the schedule we want to stay, but we probably have, what, maybe five or ten minutes for questions before we break? So taking a few more questions. You mentioned that one could bring a case without necessarily having the permission of the victims. What if the victims are all dead? In that case... Evidently, you wouldn't have the permission of the victims, but they might have next of kin. And there, again, you do not, by the letter of the convention or and, and the practice of the de, uh, of the Inter-American Commission, based in part on the significantly on the convention, even in instances involving the American Declaration, it, you do not need one does not need the authorization of the victim, nor does one need the authorization of the victim's next of kin. I sh would strongly, strongly counsel to do everything possible to work with uh, the next of kin, the local organization, grassroots community, uh, for the sake of legitimacy, best practices, ethics, and in part because what has happened, which is unfortunate, is there have been circumstances in which more than one petitioner has filed a petition on behalf of the same circumstance, which then creates an issue of you know how, whether they should work together, whether one petitioner should be held to be, quote, unquote, more legitimate, et cetera. So it's just good practice that you would want to. And you do need authorization for the court. You don't need it for the commission, but you do need it for the court. So that isn't relevant in the U.S. context, but if you're talking about litigation against another country that has accepted the jurisdiction of the court, you would need authorization of, of next of kin beneficiary or, or victim for right. court litigation. Not relevant for the United States because the United States hasn't ratify the convention nor recognize the jurisdiction of the court, but as a general principle, a good idea. Go ahead, Mary. Yeah, so I have a question about the so-called reform process that supposedly has now ended. Um, but I guess my question is, during that whole process, the U.S. government played more or less a pretty positive role, right? I mean, they were, you know, sort of in support of the commission, in support of not weakening the commission, in support of greater funding, et cetera. So I guess the question that I have is coming out of that process for US advocates, what does that mean? I mean, does it mean that the US is going to be more willing to respond better, to spend more time trying uh, to resolve cases that come out of the US? Um, does it mean that, you know, sort of how do you, how do you see it going forward given the role the U.S. played uh, and given where we are in the so-called implementation of the reforms? Yeah, so I, I think it's an excellent question and I think you, you actually have raised what could potentially be uh, a focus for advocacy and, and an opportunity, a window of opportunity. Uh, there are a number of reasons why, and I'll say what others have said, how's that? So some have said that the United States has been interested in preserving and maintaining the prerogatives and the autonomy of the commission because the United States uh, believes that a strong commission is good for democracy and the rule of law throughout the Americas. Uh, others have suggested that it might be useful for the United States for there to be a strong commission that in turn can criticize the human rights records of states uh, which may have antagonistic relationships with the United States within the Americas, okay? Whatever, and th there are other possibilities which I will not necessarily entertain, but whatever the rationale behind the United States behavior over the past year and a half, two years, I think it is true and most observers have recognized that the United States has played an important role in seeking to maintain the autonomy of the commission uh, and also an important role in preserving its funding from the range of sources, including the United States government itself, which it has received. So all to the benefit of the commission. I think it's also true, and now here I'm really uh, uh, on, on thin ice in terms of my quote unquote objectivity, is I spent the past three months uh, campaigning for a position on the Inter-American Commission, which involves meeting with 
members of 34, Delegate of 33, 34th as a state, uh, delegations and foreign ministers, et cetera. And in that process, the State Department uh, has, uh, I think, deployed a, a significant, a significant uh, uh, set of, of state resources, including John Kerry going to the uh, General Assembly in Guatemala, which is an, an, an another important factor in terms of the buy-in that the United States has in the commission and uh, in this particular commission, in the constitution of it, and in the system moving forward, okay? So, now again, uh, w in terms of the critiques, one of the critiques that the United States is interested in strengthening the American system because it's concerned about the potential rise of SILAC or of UNASUR or ALBA. It's, so there are reasons why the United States might find it in, 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 the, in the geopolitical interest of the United States to have a strong commission. With all of that said and understanding all of that, I think there really is an opportunity now for U.S. advocates to use the system because the pressure on the United States to be a bit more engaged than it might otherwise have been is really high. So this is a really good time, like the next couple, of, next year or two, I would say, to engage with the United States uh, on the theory that uh, inter-American systems probably going to get a little bit of a closer look than, than it might have gotten, say, two, three, four, five, or ten years ago. I'm not sure. Do you agree? I, I mean, I think you're in a better position than I am to have, an, you know, given the last three months. I mean, I don't disagree with anything you said. I, I don't know if that will change substantively how the state, how the United States deals with death penalty cases and immigration cases, which are the cases submitted before the inter-American system. Yeah. Um, but I which do is probably think true. But there, as you said earlier, is there are so many other areas I think in which that's the true. commission could be engaged by a broader segment of civil society and social movements in this country. I, and I think it's important for that to happen, especially in the United States. And I think that's, I think you're absolutely right in saying the United States is under a lot of pressure because as the United States has taken a positive role in this reform discussion and engaged on a deeper level with the inter-American system, other states have disengaged. Um, and, and so to counterbalance that, I think the United States has to kind of put their... I, I think they have, whatever the weird cliche, Money, I, maybe that sounded weird, and the tire hits the road, I don't know, whatever. But <laughs> I think the United States has to show that it doesn't just take the commission seriously in these diplomatic circles, but takes the commission seriously um, as it responds to cases, and hopefully that will happen. Um, I'm interested in the issue of unaccompanied minors, uh -huh. kind of as a subset of, mm -hmm. of immigration, and I'm curious, how does that fit in into this procedure? Because it's such a temporal issue that by the time the commission might hear it, you know, the children have already been detained, and right. they may be deported or gone, or that the harm is. But then harm has been, been harm has been consummated, and that's the basis for for a claim and a case. I think there's actually a case before the inter-American yeah. system on unaccompanied. I know it's been an issue that has been brought up in hearings. Um, I know it's an issue that the commission has looked at and their on-site visits. Um, I would look at the 2011 report that the commission just issued on immigration. They were very concerned with detention conditions and the mix mixing of adult and um, minor populations. And I think they've looked at unaccompanied minor. And you're correct in saying that, yeah, once the harm is consummated, precautionary measures doesn't serve your purpose, but the case does. And I think, I, I, I don't know, I could be wrong. I've already been, my memory served me well and I'm pregnant, so that's a miracle that I remember the co-memo that clearly, but I, I, it, oh look, Francisco has the actual report. Oh, fantastic. Oh my gosh, it's a miracle. It's a June miracle. My memory served me twice well. So yeah, so it's an issue that's being brought up and it's, it would be an interesting issue for a case. I think there may be a case. But again, just as an example, I, I, I had occasion to litigate a case uh, involving a policy of the Canadian government by which uh, Canadian authorities returned people who were coming across the border to Canada seeking asylum in Canada. They returned them back to the United States on the theory that the United States was a safe third country. 
uh, and they were doing a thing called Direct Back, which preceded the Safe Third Country Agreement. But the long and the short of it was that they were returning people to the United States, and then those people, if they had sought asylum, if they'd been in the United States for more than a year, they would then be returned to their country. We managed to identify three of those people who had been returned to their, to their other countries, and so we couldn't provide any remedy for them. They'd been returned to their countries and faced risk in their home countries as a consequence of their inability to apply for asylum in Canada. The case was against Canada, by the way. Uh, and there, the, the Commission proceeded with the case, accepted our theory that harm had been done by virtue of the failure to recognize the due process rights to seek asylum in Canada, and we eventually won uh, a favorable decision. Uh, but again, all of this we were doing in tandem with Canadian groups that were working in Canada, that were filing li li uh, litigation in federal courts, that were working with authorities and trying to push back on restriction of uh, Canadian asylum policies. But it's fairly analogous in that you might have, uh, you know, several UACs who were returned to Guatemala after having spent uh, two months with adults because they said they were 18, even though they're 16 or 17, uh, and there's, you know, psychological harm and other harms done to them that you can post hoc as a case and not as a precautionary measure request. Uh, seek justice through the inter-American system. And that's often the strategy, don't you think, Jim, is identifying the paradigmatic case mm -hmm. that represents a larger issue. And clearly, justice is going to be too late for that individual, but your goal is, uh, you know, the cause lawyering is about, okay, let's try and create the momentum to try change policies which we think are going to affect other chil children negatively, et cetera. I, actually, it's just a comment. I just wanted to mention a resource for folks. The Bringing Human Rights Home Lawyers Network has a working group on the inter-American system. Many of you in this room are already a part of that. But it's um, advocates who are engaged uh, working on cases or hearings before the commission come together. Um, and the working group also coordinates meetings between advocates and the State Department and commission staff once a year as well. So if anybody is interested or is already engaged in cases in front of the commission or wants to learn more, I'm happy to put you in touch with the person who coordinates that working group. Do you want to give her, since she's the last question? <laughs> Thank you. Um, We've been talking a lot today about the ICCPR, and I was just wondering if the cases that are being brought forward to the Inter-American Court are simultaneously being filed as complaints under the optional protocol of any treaty body? They can't, yeah, litis pendens, yes. So there's a rule before the Inter-American Commission that you can't submit a case before two like jurisdictions. And uh, right, but each body has the same rule preventing, they, to avoid, duplicate adjudications at the international level. But that they definitely build off each other's jurisprudence, and it was different, actually... Different victims. Different same, victims. Same, similar set of yeah. facts. Or, I mean, that, that can be done. Right. Is that quite political in the decision on where to take your case? I, yeah, I think it's, it's strategic. Mm -hmm. I think it's strategic, and you have to think about, you know, what a complaint before the UN body will achieve as opposed to a complaint before the inter-American system. And it very much depends on the country and it depends on the issue. It's very contextual. Thank you. Well, thank you all so very much. All right.